In this video, we're going to talk about population dynamics, how populations grow. We're going to look at two different theories regarding to population dynamics, some examples of how actual populations grow, as well as the growth of human population. So we're talking about the second smallest um, organization. We have, remember, the first organization is an organism. A population is a group of organisms living in the same area. The two big questions that we want to answer are, how are populations structured and how are populations are affected by the environment? There are two models that we can look at. The first one is about exponential growth and the second one is logistic growth. So there are two ways that organisms can grow its population. There's the birth rate and immigration. And there are two ways that organisms can reduce its population. There's death and immigration. We're gonna look at birth and death first as two major ways that allows population to grow or reduce its size. So the first model that we're gonna look at is exponential growth. You probably learned about exponential growth in your math class. And we have a specific equation that we're gonna use for our class for the biology model. So as you can see in this picture, there is an exponential growth uh, um, across generations. So as the generations, uh, the number of generations grows, the population size um, increases by a whole lot. And the equation that we have is the change, the dn is change in number of individuals, right here, change in number of, uh, of individuals, divided by dt, which is change in time. This equals to r max times n. r max is the rate of population growth. And specifically, it's the per capita rate of increase, how many offspring each individual have within the population. And n is the number of individuals within the population. So using this equation, you're able to calculate exponential growth. So you will likely, if you do see this on the AP test, you will likely be given a few of uh, this, these factors, and you'll be asked to calculate one of the factors. Or you might be asked to construct a graph just like this. So as long as r is a positive value, the population will continue to increase as, uh, at an exponential rate. So even if r equals to 0 0.1, you'll still see an increase in population. So here we have a comparison between uh, r equals to 1, uh, r equals to 1, and r equals to 0.5. And as you can see, when r equals to 1, the population growth rate is a lot higher and the population um, also increases a lot faster. If r is a negative value, then the population will decrease. The second model that we'll look at is logistic growth. You usually see the model of exponential growth of a population at the beginning of um, the growth of the population for a certain species. Logistic growth is usually reached after a long period of time. So as you can see, Logistic growth also have an x-axis of number of generations and the y-axis is population size. However, the first, so the first period of logistic growth is pretty similar to exponential growth where the population grows very rapidly. And then the second half of logistic growth, the population size, well, the population growth rate is going to slow down. And then eventually the population growth rate is going to be zero, it no longer changes and then he reaches a, a the population size reaches a plateau where the population size no longer changes so what k is where this this area where population no longer increases or decreases is called a carrying capacity a carrying capacity is the population size that um, an environment can allow that won't put too much of a toll on the environment so this is the maximum number of um, individuals that can live within this environment. So that's K for carrying capacity. So here we have an example of how this works. We have the population size of 25 to 1500, and then we have the same R max. And this is the equation that we use to calculate the population growth rate. And as you can see, when you have a smaller population, the population growth rate is pretty slow at first, and then eventually the population is, uh, is growing more and more as the population size is increasing. And then the population growth rate slows down, eventually reaches zero. So this is represented by this um, population growth uh, 
graph. And as you can see, this is the equation that we use for population growth, um, when the population growth is the logistic growth. So if you're asked to calculate a certain number, for example, the R max, given a whole bunch of uh, different numbers in a question, you want to first decide whether this whether this question is talking about an exponential growth model or a logistic growth model. In this picture, there is a comparison between exponential growth and logistic growth. Exponential growth keep on increasing its population and logistic growth plateaus. So it doesn't mean that the population is going to stay at 1500 exactly. It's going to go up and down a little bit, but overall it's going to stay um, very close to 1500. The reality of how population is structured First off, if you want to measure a population size, how would you measure that? We call this a mark recapture method, where you capture and mark a certain number of individuals within the population, and then you release them, and then you recapture members of the population after a certain period of time. And then you are able to use this equation in order to calculate the total population size, or an estimate for a total population size. So you would already have the recaptured Oh, the number of marked individuals at the beginning, right? You know that number, and you know the recaptured and marked individual number. And then you also have the total recaptured individuals. And then you're able to calculate the total population size. So the recaptured marked individual is when you recapture, let's say, 100 squirrels. There are only 70 squirrels that were marked um, from the initial marking. So this will be 70, and then the total recaptured individual will be 100. Uh, there are three ways a population can be uh, distributed. There's the clumped distribution, uniform distribution, and random distribution. Clump distribution exists. Is, a clump distribution is actually the most common form of, of population distribution and exists because of the inability of movement for certain species. So if there are plants that are unable to move, um, they're likely to form clumps. Another reason why a clumped uh, distribution might be formed is when there's limited resources or water that are only available at certain areas. So only these clumped areas have those resources that are available. So all of the organisms are living near that, uh, that area. There are also two other reasons why a clump distribution might be formed. For example, if you have a certain species that's clumped together, it might, uh, it might help these individuals within the population to protect themselves against uh, predators. Um, however, there are also predators that clump together to make it easier for them to catch prey. The second type of population distribution is called uniform distribution. The uniform distribution maximizes space between individuals due to competition or resources. So as you can see, these penguins are spacing out quite nicely. And the reason why a uniform distribution might be formed among these penguins is because penguins tend to defend their territories against their neighbors. They want to have their personal space and raise their youngs. And this is why a penguin might form a uniform distribution. Another example is that uh, there's this uh, salvia leucophila flowers um, that release chemicals into the surrounding areas and into the soil. This prevents other organisms as well as individuals of the same species to grow from, uh, very close to each other and this um, prevent so this allow them to have the resources that they need. This uniform distribution is less common compared to the clump distribution. The least common type of distribution is the random distribution where there's no real regularity to how the individuals are distributed, they're all over the place. This is usually because of a lack of strong social interactions between the individuals. That means that the, the individuals don't have any uh, beneficial relationship between each other, so they don't need to stay together. And they don't have harmful relationship between each other, so they don't need to be really far away from each other either. So as an example, when dandelion seeds are dispersed by wind, the random distribution will often occur as seedlings land in random places determined by uncontrollable factors. And there's also an example of oyster larva. Um, they can travel hundreds of kilometers powered by sea currents, and this also result in the random distribution of the oyster larva. Um, this next one is called population demographics. 
the word demographic means the study of a population's vital statistics and how they change over time. So it's a study of population, basically. Demographic data can be arranged in tables. As you can see, we have a few different types of data tables over here, or you can present it um, as a graph. Right now, these tab this table and the graph is only talking about birth and death rate. So let's take a look at the table real quick. In this one, we have the building, building's ground squirrels, and there's you can as you can see, you can see their age um, distribution of the squirrels, the number of uh, of alive squirrels at the start of each year, the proportion of the alive squirrels at the at the start of each year, and so on. You can see the death rate and birth rate of the males and females. You can also see a different data table. So the second data table is um, similar to the first one, but it talks about um, the distribution of males and female individuals within a litter of those squirrels. And here we have, um, here we have a graph that shows the, um, the number of survivors from the beginning to the later um, after 10 years, well, close to 10 years. And as you can see, for this specific type of squirrel, the female tend to survive better than the male, um, just because the way it is. Another important part that you want to notice with this graph is that the y-axis is number of survivors on log scale. So instead of having one, two, three, four, five as a regular linear scale, this one is on a log scale, which means this is 1 to 10, and then 10 to 100, and 100 to 1000. And even though the spacing is the same, it's a time 10 difference, right? 1 times 10 is 10. 10 times 10 is 100. If you have a linear scale, this will be 10, 20, and 30. A log scale allow you to show a larger uh, scale on the y or x axis um, on your graph. And it also shows the relationship between each data point, not as a plus and a minus relationship, but how many times smaller is the data change in, or how many times bigger. This picture shows you three major types of survival ship curves within real populations. So the x-axis is the percentage of maximum lifespan. It's not the number of years of a lifespan, but the percentage. And the y-axis is number of survivors, also on a log scale. The first type is high survival rate at an earlier stage and middle stage of life. So as you can see, the earlier stage, we have a pretty high survival rate. And then at later stage of life, there is a higher death rate, and then the population decreases a lot faster. So this survival curve usually occurs in large mammals, such as humans and elephants, because these type of organism will have really good offspring care, which allows the survival at an earlier stage, but then later on, um, the organisms uh, will not be able to survive as easily as they get older. But this third type is at the beginning of a life, you have very high level of death rate and very low level of survival rate. However, the, the life and the survival rate of this organism kind of stays the same for the later stages of life. And the reason why this uh, type of survival, survival curve exists is because the large number of offspring is produced at the beginning. And the reason why a large number of offspring is produced is because a lot of them will not survive. Um, however, the, the few offsprings that do get to survive get to live a long time. Examples are uh, long-lived plants, fish, and the marine invertebrate. And then we have number two, which is the intermediate type of survival curve. And this intermediate has a constant death rate. The death rate is the same throughout the years. An example is belding ground squirrels, and there's other rodents, invertebrates, lizards, and annual plants that have this intermediate type of survival uh, curve. There are many sp different species that fall between the three basic types, for example, so they won't really fit any of these curves, they'll kind of go in between. So an example of that would be uh, birds, for example. Birds usually have a high mortality rate 
Um, so it will show like this, it will have a high mortality rate, but then it will have a constant mortality rate throughout the adult life. And then it will kind of form a straight line over here. Another example is crabs. Crabs will kind of have a stair-stepped curve. So it will go like this. And this is because um, crabs have usually a higher mortality rate during molt, and then their mortality rate is not as high when they're not going through molting. Here we have two examples of actual exponential growth and logistic growth in actual populations. The first one is an exponential growth. We have an elephant population that grows um, pretty, pretty slow at the beginning, and then it went way up later on. And it will never have uh, a plateau, well, in this, in this case, because the population size is way below the carrying capacity of the environment, what the environment can handle. Here we have a logistic growth where there's a carrying capacity um, before, so once the, once the population reaches a certain size, they're no longer able to keep growing because the environment is only able to su support a population of a certain size. The first example is a paramecium. As you can see, the population grows very quickly at the beginning and then it plateaus. And in this example, we have a Daphnia, which is water flea. And the same thing, you have a very fast uh, growth of population at the beginning, and then it slows down and then plateaus. This is the logistic growth of population. Life history narrates the whole life of a certain organism. How many babies is it going to make when it's able to reproduce? Uh, how many of those babies are able to survive? So a life history trait is any trait that affects an organism's life table, the death rate, the birth rate. And a life history trait um, is able to form because of cause and benefits of all adaptations. So if you make a whole lot of uh, offsprings, that's going to cause a lot of energy. But then if you make more offspring, then there's a potential of having more offsprings uh, that actually survive. And this allows the survival and reproduction. Remember, when we talk about evolution, it's all about survival and reproduction and how, we can, how an organism can maximize that. There are two reproductive strategies. In this case, we're uh, talking about how many times a certain species reproduce. So there's the first one is called semiparity, where the organism only produces offspring once throughout its life. And once it uh, finishes its reproduction, it dies. And when it, usually when they produce this offspring once, they produce a lot of offspring. An example is a coho salmon, as well as this tree called a grave. So a grave grows in desert with very unpredictable rainfall and poor soil condition. So a grave will accumulate nutrients in its tissues for years. And once there's a very unusual uh, rainfall, then it's able to grow a very large flower and a lot of seeds. And then once the seeds is done being produced, this a grave tree dies. The opposite of the semel parity reproductive strategy is the iteral parity reproductive strategy, where an organism can, can reproduce multiple times throughout its lifetime. And usually when an organism does that, it produces less offspring, but that's not necessarily true. But the, the important part is, uh, is that reproduction happens repeatedly throughout the organism's life. An example is elephants. So it's all about trade-off between the offspring and energy. Now we're talking about parental care. The number of babies vary inversely with the amount of parental care. So if an organism is able to uh, produce a lot of offspring that costs a lot of energy, then it's not going to be able to have a whole lot of energy to be used for parental care. However, if an organism only produces one or a few offspring, then is able to use more energy into parental care. And this is a trade-off between offspring number and the amount of care given to each offspring. The reason that there has to be this trade-off and you can't have many offspring and give a lot of uh, parental care to each one of the offspring is because there's not an unlimited amount of resource. There's only a certain amount of energy available for the parents and the offspring. So in this example, um, there's an experiment being done on these kestrels bird. 
what they did is that they removed bird eggs from certain nests and add these birds and eggs to certain other nests. So you have a reduced brood size where there are only three to four eggs within a nest. And scientists also made some normal brood size where there are five to six eggs for the nest. And then there's also the enlarged brood size where scientists put in some extras and there will be seven to eight uh, eggs for this uh, bird to take care of. And the y-axis shows you the parents surviving uh, rate the following winter. So what you can see in this example is that the less amount of offspring these birds have to take care of, the more likely the male and the female are going to survive the winter after. And this is because they're not using as much energy on uh, childcare and they are able to survive better themselves. But for the enlarged brood size, if they have too many offsprings to take care of, they're, on, they're not able to survive as easily the winter after. So this also shows you the trade-off between, um, between child care and uh, their survival and reproduction of the organism. This next topic that we'll talk about is R-selected versus K-selected. This is in regard to the amount of offspring and how big the offspring is and the amount of parental care. So R-selected usually happens when um, there's a very low chance of survival for the offspring in the environment. Uh, for example, this could be caused by high predation rate or a very harsh environment. So the result is the reproductive strategy that these organisms come up with is that they'll make many small offspring with little parental care. So this doesn't cost as much energy for the parents. And you have, well, because you have so many small offspring, a few of those offspring is probably able to survive. And that's okay. This has an advantage at low population density where there aren't as many individuals nearby. And for example, the standalone can spread its seed uh, through air and it can land at farther places. So we call this the R selective strategy because R is the intrinsic rate of increase. It's below the carrying capacity and K stands for carrying capacity. So this is this works better for low population density. And this next one is for K selected when there's a high population density and the result is these species will produce very few offsprings and every time they produce an offspring, those offspring are also larger. So more energy are uh, put into producing this one or few offspring. And very often the case selected reproductive strategy also comes with very good and long parental care. So the very few, um, the very few offspring that are produced is likely to survive in the environment. An example over here is um, these Brazil nut trees. They only produce very few seeds, but these seeds have very good endosperm that provides a lot of nutrients for the seed and allow them to survive. Now we want to talk about how does the environment affect population growth. So in this picture, we have the x-axis for population density and y-axis birth or death rate per capita. This is an example that shows the death rate as density independent and the birth rate is density dependent. So what density independent means is that this certain factor, whether it's a death rate, birth rate, or competition, it does not change with the density of the population. If a factor is density dependent, that means this factor would change as the population gets less dense or more dense. So in this case, the death rate stays the same uh, throughout the years. So it's a density independent death rate. And birth rate is a density dependent birth rate. So for this population, the birth rate actually goes down as the population density uh, goes up. So this is kind of a, a good mechanism for many different species because uh, if the population is already very big, had bring more individuals into the population will make competition too, will give too much competition to the population. So it has its own regulating system where there are no more new offsprings that are brought to the population. On this side of the graph, we have a higher um, 
birth rate than death rate. So the population will keep growing until it reaches Q, which is the equilibrium density, where the birth rate and the death rate stays the same, so the population stays the same as well. And on this side of the graph, we have a lower birth rate than death rate, so the population would uh, keep on getting lower. This picture shows you that as the population size grows bigger, the percent of Yangshi produced, uh, producing lambs actually becomes smaller, so there are less lambs producing uh, offspring. And this is a way to keep the offspring um, population low so that the population will stop growing. And in this example, we have two different graphs. We have the population size of snowshoe hair, and you can see it goes up and down, and then the lynx, which also goes up and down. So lynx eats snowshoe hair. And what you can see is that as the snowshoe hare population goes up, the lynx population also goes up. And as the snowshoe hare population goes down, the lynx population also goes down. So there were two proposals on why this happens. The first possibility is that there's a food shortage cycle where the branches that the hare eat actually um, cycles, uh, goes through these cycles and becomes less after a certain number of years. And the second hypothesis is that there are other predator-prey interactions between hair and other organisms. So when you have a very high level of hair population, that's able to allow other predators to eat a lot of the hair, which then reduce the hair population. And then because there's less hair population, there's also less food. And then the the predator population also goes down. So this is actually what happened. Density-dependent population regulation, uh, this means that the population of a lot of organisms is regulated on its own, uh, whether, whether they want to, to be regulated or not. And here are some ways a population can be regulated. The first one is competition. Of course, when you have more individuals within the same population, there's more competition for resources, as well as mates. The second one is predation. That's easy to understand as well. If you have a very large population of a certain species, the predators is going to eat um, a lot of the preys as well to keep the prey population down. The third one is waste accumulation. For uh, In this example, we have yeast in this picture. So during winemaking, uh, yeast convert carbohydrates into ethanol. And the reason why wine never really go... Uh, never really have more than 13 percentage of alcohol content is because the uh, the higher level of ethanol concentration actually kills off the yeast so those uh, ethanol is actually toxic to yeast and it will die before it's able to produ produce more alcohol territoriality is also uh, something that keeps the population down um, because those organisms you can see this uh, cheetah peeing and uh, he's marking his territory and that's able to keep uh, the organisms apart from each other and they can fight and keep the population level down. The next one is intri intrinsic factor. In this case we have white-footed mice population and what they do is that as the reproductive, as the population density gets really high, the mice reproductive rate drops and this uh, the the cause of this is because of aggressive interactions and hormone changes that delay sexual maturation and depress the immune system. So this allows the population rate to be lowered. The last one is disease. Disease just happens on its own, but when a population density is really high, it's more likely for the disease to spread, which then keeps the population level down. The last part that we'll talk about is human population growth. Historical human population growth rate is pretty low, um, but as you can see, we our human population growth rate actually ex exceeds the exponential growth rate of a, of a normal exponential growth curve. So as an example, it took 200 years for populations to double in 1650, and only 45 years for population size to double in 1930. And uh, there are more than there are about more than two hundred thousand people being born each day. And if the growth rate doesn't slow down, it'll only take about four years to add the equivalent of another United States to the world population. However, the population growth rate has slowed down 
um, in the past uh, many years. And this is an interesting video that I'll post and you can take a look at that. This is a age structure pyramid. The x-axis has the male percentage and the female percentage. And then the y-axis is uh, the age. So as you can see, for Afghanistan, you have a very large population of younger population and not very many older, pop, uh, older population. For the United States, and the result of this is that the population growth, is, uh, growth rate is going to be pretty high. And another problem that comes with that is there might be a lot of competition for getting jobs and uh, school, getting into schools. Um, as a result of this age structure pyramid. This is Italy, where uh, we don't really have a, a whole lot of younger people, and we have some middle-aged people and some older people, and the distribution is quite even. The result of this is that the population doesn't really grow a whole lot, and there might be a problem of having too many older people in the near future. And the same thing with the United States. We have a pretty even population distribution and um, the population will not really grow if there's no immigration but because there's immigration uh, into the United States the population will grow very slowly in the next few years. So with uh, using age structure you can predict population growth trends and how many people how many younger people need to take care of the older people in the future. In this picture we have a demographic transition. A demographic transition is the going from high birth rate and high death rate eventually to low birth rate and low death rate. So a high birth rate and high death rate usually happens in developing countries or third world countries where there's a lot of birth and death. However, as a country enters, uh, becomes a developed country, then it will have lower death rate as well as um, birth rate. So on the pic uh, in the graph on the left, as you can see, the infant, mor infant mortality rate is much lower in industrialized country compared to less industrialized countries. And the life expectancy is slightly higher in the industrialized country as well. We don't know for now uh, what the global carrying capacity for the human population is going to be.